Well, thank you all for coming back for more. This is uh, week six of the online adaptation planning and practices for forest carbon management course. So in this week, we are going to move on to the fifth step in the adaptation workbook, which is about monitoring and evaluating effectiveness of our adaptation actions. So um, thanks all for um, sticking with us this long. Um, you've really we've gotten over the hump. This is now kind of the, the last few sessions of the course. Um, and a lot of the hard work uh, that you've put in is really going to be paying off here. And, you know, I, I can, I'm glad to say that, you know, if you've completed the fourth step of the workbook, um, it, it, it's much easier from here on out. So our agenda for today, we're going to do a quick review of uh, what you all were thinking about last week in step four. Um, and just talk a little bit briefly about some of the carbon implications for adaptation actions, um, just sort of in response to um, and recognizing some of the questions that we got in the bonus lecture um, last week. And then we're going to introduce um, step five of the workbook, which is all about monitoring, <clears throat> give a little bit of uh, that kind of run through of, of uh, how to uh, put this information into the adaptation workbook. So doing that tutorial, covering um, the homework, and then just talking about next week. All right, so you completed step four, hopefully. Um, I know many, uh, or at least some, we've heard from some folks that are uh, still working on it. We understand it's a, it's a big lift. Um, but, uh, but I think a lot of you probably have, have gotten through um, much of the, the effort for, for step four. So let's just take a moment to kind of review sort of where, where we are here. So, you know, in our first week, you defined your goals and objectives in step one. Then in step two, you assessed your vulnerabilities. Then Step three, you evaluated your goals and objectives given climate change. And then last week, um, you know, this is, I think, really what everybody is here for and, and looks forward to the most is that we started developing those adaptation tactics to address the challenges and capitalize on the opportunities uh, of climate. <clears throat> so when we talked about adaptation and in, in step four in the context of of carbon, you know, there, there, there's a lot of uh, nuance. There's a lot of details in there, um, and and we had a lot of good questions about this last last week. Um, and so I kind of just wanted to give this like other view of the forest carbon management menu, that kind of boils it down to sort of what I think is kind of the 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 three big um, opportunities or, or or ways to think about it. There's a number of strategies that are just really about increasing carbon. <clears throat> Those are pretty straightforward. There's another set of strategies and associated um, approaches that are about protecting kind of what we have, the existing carbon, avoiding those carbon losses. And then the last two strategies, and there's a lot of approaches underneath those strategies, those are really kind of the, um, the adaptation actions where there's kind of this nuance of sort of carbon trade-offs, short-term losses, ideally for long-term gains. <clears throat> I've talked uh, uh, in past presentations about the importance of thinking about vulnerability um, in terms of informing some, maybe some of the, some of the opportunities for adaptation that could um, provide carbon benefits. Another way to think about that way to, to, to kind of put into context vulnerability is to think about carb, the permanence of carbon is a function of the climate risk. This is something we were talking about kind of internally in our team last week. Uh, and, and it made me realize that I hadn't really stated it this way yet here in this course. And I think it's a really important way to, to be thinking about carbon recognizing that 
a lot of us may have ecosystems or projects where there's a lot of carbon stored already there. And why would we do something that removed carbon from the system if carbon is a goal? And, and it really gets down to that idea of vulnerability or climate risk. And the higher the climate risk, the less um, the, uh, we might expect that carbon to be permanent, not permanent, but uh, uh, have a lifetime in, in the ecosystem without being turned into an emission to the atmosphere. And just to connect this, I think to, to the workbook process, again, you know, in step two, we, we, we really evaluated vulnerability of our, of, our, of our projects, of our objectives, thinking about, you know, what are the impacts and what's the adaptive capacity. And then I've showed this figure here on the right-hand side about kind of the short-term losses for long-term gains through adaptation actions. And, and there were some really good questions that came up last week in the presentation, optional presentation about, you know, things like thinning or intermediate treatments. And, you know, well, do those results from that experiment that you described apply to me where I'm working? Or, you know, um, if we took this adaptation approach, isn't there going to be a loss of carbon to the system if we do that? Why might I want to do that? Or what might I expect um, in terms of getting that carbon back through growth, um, through, through forest regrowth? Those are all really key questions. And I'm really glad to hear people asking those because that is the kind of evaluation that this workbook is set up to enable you to do. We don't have quantitative models to put numbers on any of these things. There are no models to, to quantify vulnerability or risk. There are no models to put um, numbers on what you know, the, the future losses of carbon from accelerating natural disturbances might look like or how we might have a benefit through adaptation. None of these things can be quantified very easily. And so what we're left with is kind of qualitative evaluations. What I like to think of as mental models, um, but it's really using our experience, our judgment, and you know, our expertise and, and looking to what the scientific literature says to put all these things together. And then to help us evaluate sort of what is our risk tolerance? You know, are we really risk averse and we don't want to uh, risk losing carbon by not doing anything? Or do we have a, fair high, a fairly high tolerance of risk and we're willing to take an approach <clears throat> that might mean not doing any kind of active management um, because we want to kind of hedge our bets and, and or, or we want to kind of bet on not losing that carbon to a future disturbance, right? So I, I think it's just really important. I just want to call out that these questions and, and considerations and evaluations that, that I hear people making are really important and they're very key. And we don't have any whiz bang model to just put a number on it. And then of course, there is that final or that additional consideration of, well, there are these other things that we're trying to manage for here as well, um, possibly uh, in addition to carbon. We might be thinking about habitat for an endangered species that, you know, um, that habitat preference, it might mean a removal of carbon to achieve, to achieve those um, conditions. Um, and so that's all really, you know, key considerations in thinking about these adaptation actions. Okay, so kind of with that <laughs> diatribe aside, um, let's turn our attention now to step five, what we are going to be tackling this week. So this week, um, you're going to be brainstorming ways to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of those actions that you 
selected or those tactics that you selected in step four. Um, <clears throat> as you start to complete um, the adaptation workbook, as you complete step five, you'll kind of be completing the workbook process. Uh, you can also, you know, look at the function of exporting your workbook to a, a Word document or a PDF. And this kind of helps you just to see how each step um, has um, the details in each of the steps to so that you can start to think about how you can communicate the intention of your adaptation plan. Um, and we can show you how to do that um, here in, towards the end of this, uh, this lecture. We'll show you how to export this um, plan. <clears throat> okay, so a few thoughts about monitoring. Monitoring really is essentially about asking the right questions to help you kind of understand and detect whether or not the desired conditions that you are um, interested in are being achieved over time. Now, there's uh, several different types of monitoring that you encounter in science and management. For example, scientific research as a monitoring tool. You know, we have a hypothesis and, you know, with replication, we can use statistics to kind of track trends and evaluate um, uncertainty over time. The reality is, is that a lot of us will find this difficult to do. Um, it requires a lot of years. It requires a lot of sampling. Um, to detect statistical change, you know, replication is something that may kind of be at odds with a, a really a management focus. Um, and so we don't often use this type of monitoring and adaptation planning, but um, Luke's going to talk about some examples um, that from experiments with a strong research focus. And I think it's really, it's really important to kind of keep those you know, research focused monitoring um, approaches in mind. And, and, you know, and then just also understanding or, or recognizing that research oftentimes informs sort of what we as managers can do. You know, we look to the research to, to kind of give us some, some guidelines in terms of what we might be able to expect or um, why we might expect something different uh, if our site conditions are different. Another type of monitoring is impact or response monitoring. So, you know, we realize that, you know, as climate changes over time, um, so might the conditions on our, on our site. This <clears throat> type of monitoring doesn't really like rigorously support cause and effect, um, but it, you know, it consists of, of repeated measurements done in a repeatable manner. Um, to, to specific uh, standards. So for example, you know, we can use forest inventory and stocking surveys to measure growth, or canopy cover, or ground cover, survival of seedlings. You don't really need statistics to analyze some of that data. Um, similarly, phenology monitoring, where you record the dates of leaf out or you know, the arrival of a particular bird species every spring. This type of monitoring you know, is attempting to kind of provide some insights <clears throat> that are relevant to your management goals, but it's oftentimes you know, easier to do and less expensive than scientific monitoring, um, but does require uh, you know, sort of a dedication um, and, and uh, an expense in terms of time to do that. <clears throat> then we have implementation monitoring. And so this is really useful when we're thinking about, you know, did we do the thing that we said we were going to do? Um, it's often kind of a yes, no observation. Did we plant a thousand tree seedlings? You know, did we, did we um, reach our desired, you know, um, goal of X number of trees per acre in doing that? And then finally, um, the last is effectiveness monitoring. And this is really kind of, you know, given the, the, the focus of the workbook, this is oftentimes really the, the type of monitoring that fits in nicely with, um, with the workbook and, you know, 
answering the question, did the, did the actions that we took have the desired effect? Did they work? For example, if you, you know, installed berms to slow the overland flow of water, <clears throat> after some time, is the water slowed? Does the downhill system become less inundated? You know, um, this type of monitoring is usually carefully designed based on a conceptual model of the system and supports cause and effect over meaningful time periods. And this type of monitoring, you know, typically works very well for adaptation. Okay, so the key questions for this week um, for, for monitoring is to consider um, what existing monitoring efforts are available and if they need to be modified to better monitor the results of your adaptation actions. You can also consider what new monitoring items might be required to evaluate whether you've met your management goals. So let's walk through kind of the, the three key components of monitoring that you're gonna be putting in to the adaptation workbook. <clears throat> so the first thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna identify your monitoring variable. Um, monitoring items uh, that'll be useful will really help you to evaluate whether you've achieved your management objectives and goals um, or whether you've achieved a milestone that indicates progress towards your goal. Um, when possible, um, we should always look to select monitoring items that will also help us understand whether or not the adaptation tactics that we recommended in the previous deck were effective in working towards our management goals under climate change. <clears throat> so an example being, you know, if your tactic is to underplant with future adapted species that are suitable for your system, you may choose to monitor the survival rate of those seedlings. Um, and this might be different than how you would implement kind of a standard survey. Um, you know, you might have a more, um, more frequent, you know, monitoring time period or something like that. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so the next um, bit of information that we're going to be looking at in this step is sort of what is the criteria for evaluation? <clears throat> so it's really useful to identify kind of is there a value or a threshold that's meaningful to, to understand whether or not, you know, you're achieving success. So you know, think about sort of the units that you're using to measure your metric. Um, and is there kind of a, a target number that might be indicative of uh, success? So just playing off of that last example, um, you know, what number of surviving seedlings would represent success? In this example, we chose 60% survival as the criteria. You know, this might be kind of a squishy number, you know, but there's, there's oftentimes kind of a range where below that number, you know, it, it doesn't feel like the action was really effective. You know, you had low survival, it wasn't worth the effort and the cost probably to do it. Um, and over that number, it was, you know, it, it, there's a high likelihood that, um, that you'll be ultimately able to achieve uh, what you're seeking to do. <clears throat> And then the last, uh, the last key piece here is implementation monitoring. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, this kind of describes how and when the information is going to be gathered. For example, you may monitor seedling survival every summer for five years after planting, <clears throat> and then because you might have some new species, you know, you might want to be doing it. Um, every year. So it's key to remember, like, if you can take advantage of existing monitoring surveys or inventories that you already have, um, that's going to be really, you know, that's going to be really useful to take advantage of, of the monitoring that you've already got going on. <clears throat> All right, so here's just some examples of what this looks like. Um, 
you know, invasive species are something that people are oftentimes already monitoring for. Um, and so, you know, the criteria here might be in those areas where we have invasives established, um, having less than 20% cover from those invasive species would be a criteria for success. Um, and, you know, the implementation being annual invasive species surveys. Regeneration success, um, a criteria might be more than 50% of the desirable species in a certain size class. And how you would do that would be regeneration surveys every few years um, after a, a harvest happens. Um, for uh, forest canopy cover, you know, maintaining a certain level of canopy cover in um, whatever area it is, you know, in riparian areas, perhaps because that's a key number for um, shading in streams to maintain cold water fish species, you know, something like that. Um, and that could be done in your forest inventory that happens every, you know, five years or so. <clears throat> and similarly, you know, thinking about like, if you have water related um, goals, uh, water quality related goals, you know, kind of looking at like, what are some of the, what are some of the um, things like um, oh, TMDLs or something like that, that you can look to for, um, for kind of some key metrics. <clears throat> What's important is that, you know, the outcome is of this, of this step is really we want to be realistic. We want to be creating feasible monitoring plans that you can implement. You know, um, it's oftentimes difficult to find the time, the staff time, you know, the funding, whatever it is, uh, to really do like the perfect monitoring plan. And so we don't want to have, you know, the perfect be the enemy of the good here. We want to really be thinking about monitoring from a perspective of what can we actually do. Um, and, you know, are there opportunities to partner uh, with other, you know, organizations um, or elsewhere, you know, educational institutions? Are there students, are there volunteers that you can get to, to um, help you do some of this monitoring? <clears throat> so <clears throat> um, I think we've, we've shown this graphic before, but you know, it's really important to um, that kind of the, the workbook and, and all the information that you're putting into the workbook kind of follows this logical um, train of thought, this clear train of thought that shows the intentionality of what you're trying to achieve um, in your climate informed management plan. <clears throat> and you know, so we can kind of think about that from like your goals and objectives to your actions, but we can also think about that in the reversed order. Um, and, and so as we finish our monitoring plans, um, our metrics are hopefully, you know, directly linked to measuring the effectiveness of our adaptation tactics, um, which describe, you know, how we're going to implement our strategies and our overall concepts and how that links to our overall concepts of you know, resistance, resilience, and transition. And so we can trace these you know, back to you know, the management challenges and opportunities that the climate change impacts on our systems and ultimately you know, back to our, um, what we identified as our goals and objectives. So you know, essentially monitoring really helps us know whether or not we're on track to meet those goals and objectives. All right, so with that, um, we're gonna talk through some examples of monitoring. I'm gonna start off with talking a little bit about effective no effectiveness monitoring, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Luke to talk about some um, monitoring from a more carbon uh, research perspective. <clears throat> so uh, to start off with, I'm going to talk about effectiveness monitoring, and I'm going to use that example from the Welgen Brown Forest um, <clears throat> demonstration project, which was, uh, just as a reminder, it was a project that was looking at um, hemlock and 
uh, uh, and you know recognizing the um, the uh, hemlock woolly adelgid in and what it represented in terms of a risk for the carbon that was on that stand, which was uh, in a in a carbon enrolled in a carbon offsets program. <clears throat> And so one of their objectives was to create a mixed species stand that was able to provide sequestration in future decades, given uh, the likely impacts of the hemlock woolly adelgid. And so they chose as their monitoring variable, the presence of future adapted species in the understory. And the time scale was that they decided that they wanted to um, do the harvest uh, and then um, evaluate um, regeneration in the stand 14 years after uh, the harvest. So probably not anticipating that they would see things, you know, immediately afterwards. And the criteria for success was that they wanted to see 30% of the stems that were climate adapted species. So essentially 30% that was not hemlock in their stand. <clears throat> They had um, a second goal, uh, or uh, sorry, a second objective of their, of their goals related to carbon, which was that they wanted, um, they recognized that by doing this 30% basal area removal in their hemlock stand, that they would be removing a lot of carbon. And so they had the objective to be um, uh, regaining that carbon over time uh, um, from just regrowth in the forest. <clears throat> and so they um, identified, you know, just kind of a, a, a general monitoring variable of using in their inventory data to, to monitor carbon. And, you know, so that is, you know, sort of using the monitoring that they were already planning on doing because they're an offsets project, they have to be monitoring every six or seven, I think for their program, it was every seven years, they were gonna be doing inventory. So they were gonna be using that inventory uh, that they were already doing to be evaluating whether or not they were achieving this goal of um, their biomass um, increase being greater than the amount of carbon that they removed in their harvest. And, um, and, and this is really just kind of using, you know, basic kind of standard inventory, um, inventory methods. Uh, this is just a, a data sheet that, that I had found that is uh, associated with the Family Forest Carbon Program. And, um, and I will say that this probably looks familiar to at least some folks on the call because some of the people here, and I won't name any names in case they wanna remain anonymous, that um, this was actually put together by several people who are in our course. Um, so we've got some, some carbon experts already out here, in here in, in our course. Um, but you can see that you know, this is pretty kind of standard inventory approach just in terms of you know, measuring height and DBH and, you know, um, um, decay, decay class and snags, those sorts of things in, um, in plots. Um, and, you know, if you want to be thinking about uh, carbon in deadwood pools uh, in, in coarse woody debris, so not snags, you know, there, there are protocols um, that you can easily look up to, to um, kind of evaluate how much carbon might be stored in, in coarse woody debris as well, if that's part of, of your inventory that you want to include. All right, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Luke to present on the next couple of slides. Cool, thanks, Todd. Yeah, um, well, first up, uh, I'll, I'm, gonna prov I'm gonna show three different examples of monitoring that I've been involved in. Um, the first of these is the most pure research. Uh, it's also the most holistic because it focuses on the thing that all of us really want to know about, the net carbon balance of the whole ecosystem. Uh, in this case, as net ecosystem production. I think back to that presentation Todd gave earlier in the course about metrics of carbon sequestration. 
We started with a, about a hundred year old unmanaged Aspen dominated forest here in Northern Lower Michigan. Uh, our objective was to accelerate what was at the time an ongoing successional transition to longer lived species. Um, we implemented the treatment in 2008 by stem girdling all of the aspen and birch on about 100 acres. Um, we knew through 10 years of monitoring before that time that the forest was a reliable carbon sink, the whole ecosystem. Uh, pulled down something like one to two tons per acre per year. Um, but we wanted to know after Aspen in unmanaged forest land like this, are we still looking at a carbon sink? Uh, if not, um, why? So we set up this experimental treatment. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the thing I'll first call your attention to is the, the figure in the upper right. That's a map. We had two flux towers. We wanted to be able to sense for a whole airshed, a whole tower footprint, the net carbon balance of the ecosystem. And, and the larger footprint there on the west is the control tower. And then the smaller footprint uh, there to the northeast is the treatment tower. And that's about 100 acres of treatment area. Um, the, the lines you see are plot networks because we don't just care about the net balance. We want to know what's going on by taking measurements within plots, inventory, soil respiration, soil carbon stocks, that sort of thing, and, and be able to account for the components of net ecosystem carbon balance. Um, really what I wanna draw your attention to in terms of findings, um, I've circled here the figure panel in the upper left from this paper that my friend and colleague Chris Goff recently led. Um, we're looking at time series for NEP, net, net ecosystem production, carbon balance. And the green time series is the control, the orange is the treatment. The data picks up uh, in 2008, the year when we did the stem girdling of all the aspen and birch. And what I'd like to point out is that we you know, went through a, a period of sort of reorganization as the aspen died that took about three years. But the system has come back without Aspen as a stronger carbon sink than it used to be. Um, this is research. We didn't want to know just what the trend was, but why it happened. Um, we thought that getting rid of that homogenous smear of Aspen dominance, um, releasing those codominance and overtopped stems of a, of a greater diversity of species, we thought we would arrive at a more complex canopy that made it more efficient at harvesting light. Uh, Cause you know, harvesting lights where carbon capture all begins. It's all starts with photosynthesis. Um, and we had other projects suggesting that canopy complexity is an important constraint on carbon uptake. Um, we found that we really didn't get a noticeable increase in canopy complexity, but what we did see was a number of metrics of much more of, of increased efficiency. Um, we found, for instance, that the lower left shows that the carbon use efficiency of the treatment forest, so maples, oaks, pines, beech, those at the community level are more carbon use efficient. They do, they, they waste away less of, less of their fixed carbon through respiration. Uh, aspen, you know, it's got a fast metabolism, so it respires away a lot of the carbon that it pulls down through photosynthesis. Another thing we found where we haven't published it, we're working on it right now, is that um, the non-Aspen version of this future forest is also more water use efficient. So more carbon uptake per unit water lost through transpiration. Um, that's a thing that's been observed at, at many uh, long-term sites like this, Harvard Forest, Howland Forest, uh, out, out east, places that have shown these 20, 30 year increases like UMBS, uh, of increasing NEP over time in the absence of any experiment, that's happening because forests in the humid east are getting more water use efficient. So that's probably temporary. When you think about the, the trajectories of climate change, the warming, the drying we're looking at, um, but it might point the way this research to how we might manipulate species composition in the future uh, to favor 
increased water use efficiency, especially as the climate becomes more hostile to uh, profligate users of water. Um, the next example, Todd, uh, next slide. This comes from Adaptive Aspen Management Experiment, AME. Um, I think you've, you've read about that. Um, AME, like, like the previous example, was also scientific research, but uh, at an operational scale. We needed this project to be economically feasible so there would be a good demo site, a good demonstration site uh, where we could implement abstract forest adaptation concepts like resistance, resilience, and transition um, in the context of Lake State's Aspen forestry. One of our goals with AME was to limit and then evaluate management impacts on soil carbon and related soil properties. For that goal, we specified a short-term objective of quantifying how the timing of harvest influenced the amount of soil disturbance. I wanna note here that we actually wanted some soil disturbance, at least in our resistance treatment. That's the one pictured here. It was cut in September and October of 2019. We wanted disturbance on the ground there because that treatment was intended to resist the impacts of climate change by regenerating aspen birch. That's a forest type that's got a number of climate loser species, birch in particular, which regenerates better on a mineral soil seed bed. So this is an example of how sometimes you can have carbon as a co-benefit and other times it's a competing objective. We think that overall um, carbon is a co-benefit of our climate adaptation treatments in this experiment because harvesting increased the landscape level uh, complexity, diversity of what we started with, a homogenous 110-year-old aspen forest. Um, that's at the heart of our carbon goal, which was to maintain current rates of carbon sequestration into live biomass in the coming decades. But on the other hand, in one of the treatments, we wanted to disturb soils and, and, and put soil carbon at risk in order to improve our regeneration of paper birch. Uh, climate loser species. We did that in a, a topographically appropriate place. Uh, we worked with the site um, in order to, to make sure that we were going to have maximum odds of achieving good paper birch performance in the future, um, it, even though that meant we're probably going to have, at least over the short term, a negative impact on soil carbon. Next slide, Todd. So here's the results. Um, there's a lot in these two figures. On the left, we're looking at the percentage of the area in each unit that had exposed mineral soil. Uh, and we have a moving from left to right, a reference unit that was not touched, a unit that was cut uh, with full snow cover, a unit that was cut with uh, diminishing, declining snow cover, and then the, the resistance unit, the farthest one on the right, no snow cover, that uh, September, October, cut. Um, <clears throat> what we saw was, you know, if you have full snow cover, no exposed mineral soil. Operations where the forwarder and the, the processor had no impact in terms of exposing mineral soil. That was a pretty good snowpack year, 20, 30 inches. Um, as it started to uh, diminish, um, we see a significant increase in mineral soil exposure is still below the 15% the threshold. That's often a rule of thumb for aspen forestry. And then when we cut without snow cover in that resistance unit, we really, you know, over a quarter of the, the area was exposed mineral soil. Ruts, that's the panel on the right. Um, with a full snowpack, there was no rutting. Um, however, for units that were cut with no snow cover or declining snow cover, those had significantly more ruts, not different from each other, but it would seem that um, the declining snow cover, while it's getting thinner, it's still enough to keep the machinery off the ground. So not uh, scraping away the forest floor, exposing the mineral soil, but uh, not enough snow. It, the, the mass propagates downward through the snow and still achieves some rutting. And this isn't bad ruts. This is just any presence of ruts. Um, point being, um, uh, thinking about slash cover, because people talk about slash a lot as a BMP and, and how that can protect soil carbon, um, 
about 59% of the cut units had slash cover. And we didn't ask the operators uh, to do anything with the slash because we weren't worried about compaction or erosion on our sandy soils. And because we had other plans for the slash. In one of the units, we had the processor operator make about 40 piles over the 16 acre cutting unit. Each of those piles was five or six feet high and 15 to 20 feet in diameter. And those were little islands for red oak to recruit into. We get pretty good browse pressure on the oak in this area. Um, I've heard about slash walls out east um, and, and slash islands have been used in Michigan. Both seem uh, promising in the right context as ways of using residues to protect your region. Um, and I, I just want to point out that people are, are often are thinking more and more and asking more and more of their harvest residues. Um, in some places, it might be a bioenergy uh, feedstock. Some places, it's browse control. To those of us who think about soils a lot, it's uh, slash armoring is probably thing number one you can do to protect the ground surface. But in the end, there's only so much of it to go around. So it's worth thinking about how it's going to be utilized um, in an experiment like this. My last example is an example of response monitoring, Todd. Uh, again, from AAME, this time looking at the above ground part of the ecosystem. Uh, no statistics here. Um, so I mentioned our, coal, our carbon goal here was to maintain rates of carbon sequestration into living trees into future decades. That's despite um, what we recognize as a potential for declining growth with climate warming and drying. Um, our objective towards reaching that goal was uh, to diversify the forest at the landscape level in terms of composition and structure. And our different cutting treatments are the different approaches we use towards reaching that overall goal and those objectives. Again, through resistance, resilience, and transition uh, concepts. We know from our other work at the U of M Biostation that for about three to five years, um, the rate of above ground biomass carbon sequestration is diminished after we do a, a canopy removal compared to if we'd done nothing. But that's all the time it takes to get leaf area back. Uh, and then the system is right back to being a strong carbon sink. So we set our, our monitoring timeframe to capture those initial dynamics, and then also periodically um, revisit these uh, managed stands over a decadal time scale. One thing I haven't mentioned yet, but which I'll point out now, we had about a half dozen 10 acre stands in the same area that were cut about 35 or 40 years ago. So with those, we can look at forest land that's currently mid-rotation um, in addition to the uncut reference area that we didn't touch where 100-year-old aspen still dominates. Next slide, Todd. Okay, so two sets of results here. Uh, the table shows sapling stocking levels in terms of number of stems per acre. Uh, we did four mill acre subplots per plot and had about a half dozen plots in each cutting unit or each treatment, since uh, treatment can include the reference, the mid-rotation, those are those 35 or 40-year-old cuts I mentioned, and then our resistance, uh, resilience, and transition units. And here, uh, Poger is uh, Populus granitentata, Big Tooth Aspen, and Fager, Fagus grandifolia. Um, we tallied up saplings at least three feet tall up to a DBH of three inches. We also measured basal diameter and height on each stem we encountered, but um, those data don't really tell anything that the stem densities don't already. And what I'd like to point out as a mix of what you'd expect and what you or I did not. Um, so not surprisingly for the reference and mid-rotation stands, very little aspen present. The only reason you see any in the mid-rotation, those are the, the last few straggling overtopped stems uh, that are on their way out and self thinning. The interesting stuff is in terms of the cutting treatments. Um, look first at that resilience treatment. Um, these are, we actually had two cutting units of the resilience treatment. One was a 95% aspen removal, the other was a 75% aspen removal. 
we left all the co-dominant and accessory species. Uh, the aim in, in both units was to regenerate aspen, but with a, a, a scattered canopy of all the other species, increase that complexity, that diversity. So we did pretty good at regenerating those aspens, you know, four or 5,000 stems. Transition, um, it looks like we managed to keep the, the regeneration of aspen down a little bit. The intent here is to, to move the system away from aspen um, through shading by codominant and released stems. <clears throat> the, the thing that I find most interesting is the resistance treatment. That was the one where we wanted to get aspen birch back, but it actually has a much lower aspen regen density. Um, and this is because of season of harvest. We cut that unit in the fall and aspen foresters know when you cut aspen in a non-dormant state, you get delayed regen. Um, nobody I know is worried yet about aspen failing to come back after a cut on a site like this, but I know a lot of people worried about birch. So that's why I've included this graph of soil moisture content on the upper right. Um, have a look at the sustained, highly elevated soil moisture in the, the resistance treatment, the black dots. Um, when you get delayed regen, that means less aspen coming back in those first two seasons after cutting. So less leaf area sucking up soil water and transpiring it away. We really wanted to give paper birch all the help it could get in this unit, because um, unlike big tooth aspen, which is predicted to do okay with warming and drying, paper birch has been struggling with heat and droughts at our site for years. Um, so with the autumn cut in this resistance unit, we took some actions that were to the short-term detriment of carbon. The soil disturbance, the delayed regeneration of, of good aspen growth, but that's because we were willing to compromise on carbon in the short term, to achieve some different compositional adaptation goals. Um, I think that over the long run, it'll come, the, the stand will readily catch back up in terms of carbon, but hopefully more of that carbon will be in birch. I think in the interest of time, any questions that folks have are something we should address later, because now it's time for Danielle to take us through the cookbook. Happy to talk with anybody about these findings. Todd, did you want to do this or were you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess we didn't, we didn't plan this out. Um, I, I'm happy to do it, Danielle. Okay, yeah, I'm here just in case, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so um, yeah, in, in the remaining minutes left, we're gonna just go quickly through, um, through the tutorial. Uh, and for for uh, for monitoring for step five here, um, and just kind of in summary here, um, you know it's it's really about adding adding a monitoring variable and all those details that I that I talked through, and then um, and then applying it to to whichever objectives you already have in your workbook, um, and so it's it's pretty straightforward. Um, and so here, here's what it looks like. When you start the step five, um, you'll kind of just have this blank screen here and you'll have that add a monitoring variable uh, field that you'll click on. And once you do that, those three fields will pop up that describe you know, what's the variable, what's the criteria for evaluation, what's the implementation. So you'll fill in those fields. And then once you do that, then this window, uh, uh, this view will pop up that um, shows you, uh, ask this question, does this monitoring variable apply to these objectives? And so here's where you, you don't have to repeat these monitoring variables for every objective. You can just say for each monitoring variable and associated information, it applies yes, no to, to these objectives. Um, <clears throat> After you do that, of course, there is the homework that's associated with this step of the workbook. <clears throat> and then at the very beginning, I mentioned um, exporting your, your um, 
your plan, your adaptation plan. And so if you look down here at the very bottom of your, um, of, the, of your menu here on the left-hand side, you have this export and share plan. And if you click on that, then you'll, you'll see kind of your, um, your workbook sort of pop up in this summarized form. And if you select, um, you can select any number of things. Uh, you can save it as HTML or you can print it. If you hit print, then um, it'll tell you it's going to format it. And then uh, according to the landscape, and then you just basically, you know, print it as a PDF in, in order to save it uh, on your on your machine. So pretty straightforward, but this, but but when you when you get through this last step, um, do this and then evaluate kind of, you know, you can see everything in your workbook kind of all in one place. And you can you can kind of scan through things and and just really evaluate like if you feel like you've represented everything that you're trying to achieve in your project or is there anything that's sort of missing that you thought that you had um, emphasized or, or that you had included or maybe something that you hadn't emphasized enough? Um, and then you, you can always go back and, and of course, um, put more information into the workbook. All right, so um, for next week, of course, you're, you guys are, are used to this now. Our, um, Homework for or assignment for next week is uh, to, to complete step five, complete the homework associated with it. And in your course materials, you'll see a, a link to this paper that uh, Maria Genoviak had uh, led that was published in the Journal of Forestry back in 2017. I think it's a really great uh, example of thinking about monitoring, thinking about climate, uh, climate risk, um, and kind of from that perspective of, of monitoring and seeing, you know, <clears throat> are we getting to where we want to be in terms of, you know, having uh, enough species or having the right species on our site that we think is, are, are going to do well in future climates. Um, and so check out that uh, assessing stand level climate change risk using forest inventory data and species distribution models paper. Um, and then, of course, this is all to be completed by next Monday. So looking ahead next week, um, we'll have our usual lecture on Monday this time. <clears throat> We're going to start to be thinking about communication. Um, and so Danielle's going to uh, give a presentation about con communication concepts and tips. And then we are going to have a discussion sessions next Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, and so be prepared to talk about your adaptation, adaptation tactics and monitoring ideas. So uh, a little bit of incentive to um, get through uh, steps four and five before next week, or at least have a, a good idea of, of what um, you're gonna be doing for those steps. All right, and with that, we are coming in three minutes under the top of the hour. So it just squeaked in there. <laughs>